I joined the United Methodist Church when I was 12 years old following confirmation. Um, it was honestly my first real adult decision. Um, at the time, I had no idea what it meant to be involved in church, but I can say that I have finally figured out what it means to be involved at church. On Pentecost Sunday in 1992, I stood up in front of my whole church and demonstrated that I actually learned something at confirmation. I learned something in my classes, in attending worship. We were required to attend every different church committee meeting, so we knew what each part of the church did. We had confirmation projects and volunteer hours, and I stood up and answered one of the many questions, but this one has always sunk in with me. Will you support this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service? And now we have since added witness. I gave my grown-up response of I do and I will. I was given a grown-up Bible with no pictures, much to my dismay. A gift from my mentor, which was a prayer rock. I actually still have it. I promise I never threw it at my sister. Not quite sure what is actually supposed to do with it. And a gift from the finance committee, my very own box of offering envelopes with my name on them. I freaked out when I saw the offering envelopes because it meant that I was no longer a child. It meant that I could no longer put random pocket change that I had been putting aside as I was hoarding money for the movies into the collection plate anymore. At least that wouldn't cut it with my family. These offering envelopes were a sign that I had made a real commitment to the church and to God. But I didn't get that that wasn't the only gift I could give. That's not to say that I don't think tithes are important, which I do think they're incredibly important. But it's just one of the ways that we freely give to God. Our scripture this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8 and points to the other ways that we share our gifts with God and with one another. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though, there are many of us. We are one body in Christ, and individually we belong to each other. We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, you should prophesize in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do so with no strings attached. Paul's main point here about spiritual gifts is that God has given each one of these gifts as members of the body of Christ so are we to use the particular gift God has given us to help the body function. We aren't to use them to promote ourselves or show how one body part is better than another, but we are use them to build up the body of Christ. In our lifetime, we have seen some wonderful and gifted people in our families, in our circle of friends, in our community of faith, and in our world. I couldn't help but think about two in particular, especially this weekend, who are so gifted and selfless. They, these two people challenged conventional thinking. They showed radical acts of kindness and hospitality and love. I couldn't think of two better people than Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King Jr., for over 45 years, Mother Teresa ministered to the poor, and we know her story. We could conjure up many images of her work in Calcutta with the sick and the poor and the orphaned. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and many other honors in her lifetime, but she didn't think that these earthly honors mattered. When she received the Nobel Peace Prize, she was asked what we can do to promote world peace. She said, go home and love your family. In the lecture she gave, she said, around the world, not only in poor countries, I see poverty, but also in the West, it's so much more difficult to remove. 
When I pick up a person from the street hungry, I give him a plate of rice and a piece of bread. I have satisfied that hunger. But a person that has been shut out or feels unwanted, unloved, terrified, the person who has been thrown out from society, that type of poverty is so hurtable and so very much more I find difficult. We also know the story of Martin Luther King Jr., whose this weekend we celebrate his birthday. Had he not have died at the age of 39, he would have been in his 80s this week. What a remarkable life for such a short one. We know him for being a clergyman, an activist, a prominent leader in the civil rights movement. We know of his work with nonviolent civil disobedience. We know of his bus boycott and his march on Washington and his ever famous I have a dream speech. He too received the Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolence. I wish I could be as good of a speaker as Dr. King. I wish I could be as compassionate as Mother Teresa, but I'm not. All of us have these wonderful gifts that God has given us. So I guess the question we should be asking ourselves is what gifts has God given each of us today? For me, there are the gifts that I think I have, the gifts I wish I had, the gifts I'm certain that I don't want to have, and then the actual gifts that God has given me, which I'm stuck with, I mean blessed to have. I recall many, many, many conversations about spiritual gifts in seminary, and we had to take this silly mini-term class on spiritual gifts, and, you know, I didn't take it seriously. It's kind of hard to believe I didn't take something seriously, right? So here's the thing. We sat around in this seminar classroom, sipping our overpriced coffee, wearing our scarves, and thinking we were better than most people and filling out these inventories because we wanted to see what God has gifted us with. And as we sat around the table and I listened to my classmates' responses, I couldn't help but wonder about some of these gifts listed on this particular assessment, including servanthood, interpretation, shepherding, compassion, exhortation, apostleship, healing, leadership, speaking in tongues, teaching, administration, wisdom, knowledge, helping, faith, prophecy, miracles, giving, discernment, exorcism, and evangelism. When it was my turn to list my top five gifts, I decided to add a few extra ones for fun just to get a reaction out of my class. I listed teaching and helping and administration and prophecy and exorcism. I'm not entirely sure how I got the last one out with a completely straight face, but I looked at my professor and classmates' stone faces, and I still didn't laugh. And they waited for a moment, and one young man in particular raised his hand, very calmly and seriously asked me, how are you able to use this gift of exorcism in a future ministry setting? My response was this, well, I really don't have the gift of exorcism, but I have the gift of sarcasm, which I think will be a great fit for future administrative council meetings. And I do think it's a great fit for administrative council meetings. All kidding aside, these inventories can be helpful if you don't know exactly what your gifts are. And there are many different ones out there. And if you're curious, I can point you in that direction. But it's a good way to figure out what maybe you're called to do. 
I've also figured out it's a good way to think about the things you like to do at church and the things you don't like to do at church. But we use our spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ, to build up our community of faith, to reach out and love to one another here and across the world, and most importantly, to build up the kingdom of God now and in the time to come. We use our spiritual gifts because they are from God. We use them to witness to our faith, to stand up for what is right, to feed the hungry, to advocate for justice, to proclaim the goodness, mercy, grace, and love of Jesus Christ to everyone we encounter. We aren't called to hold on to our gifts. We aren't called to only use them on Sunday. We aren't called to lord them over the heads of others. We are called to use them every day and to use them freely. We are called to use our gifts with our families and friends at school and at work, with our hobbies, with our civic interests. We are called to use our gifts and to use them freely and without boasting, though I do boast the gift of exorcism. What are your gifts? What has God given you? Have you been given the gift of welcoming people? Well, goodness, we have a place for so many of you. Join Welcome and Invitation. Join Reconciling Ministries. Make Marilesta happy and become a greeter. Have you been given the gift of music? Talk to Jean, sing in the choir, ring a handbell, play an instrument. Have you been given the gift of healing and compassion and visiting other people? I'm certain Jeannie Swenson and I can find a place for you with congregational care. Have you been given the gift of teaching? I certainly can find a place for you. You could lead a basics class. You could start a new study. You could help with children's Sunday school or children's church or youth group. Have you been given the gift of fixing things? Jim Walt, do you have a place for people who can fix things? Absolutely. Have you been given the gift of cooking? I know a bunch of these kids have. We could use those gifts for community meal. We could use them to make meals for people in our church who need a little help. Have you been given the gift of advocacy? I'm certain Gail Woods can find a place for you. Have you been given the gift of knitting or crocheting? Did you know that Tammy Eady wants to start a prayer shawl ministry? Talk to her. Do you know that we even have a place for people who are good at numbers and budgets and finance? I'm certain you could talk to Gary. I'm certain you could talk to Curtis. I'm certain you could talk to Sam. And there is a place even for you. We have so many gifts to offer, both financially and spiritually. The financial gift is so important. My 12-year-old self freaked out at those offering envelopes. At 32, I'm beginning to understand that each of them is so vital to the ministries that we do, not just about Sunday school and Honduran scholarships, but about toilet paper, Joe Prin and the excessive post-it notes I use that Claudia can attest to, and I promise I will be a better steward of my post-it note usage. Each of these gifts are important, and it's a challenge. Sometimes it's a challenge to give a little extra. Sometimes it's a challenge to spend a little more time. Each gift matters, no matter how large or small, each of our spiritual gifts matter, no matter how much time it takes, no matter if the giver is two or a hundred and two. We have traditional gifts. We have alternative spiritual gifts. Everyone is important. I would leave you with a few things this morning to remember that we are the body of Christ. We have many parts and not all of us have the same function and not all of us do things the same way. We all have different spiritual gifts. We use them in different ways, but they are consistent with the grace that God has given us, both traditional and alternative. 
But really, whatever gifts we give, financial and spiritual, we should give them freely with no strings attached. Amen.